During World War II, the Allies' victory in the Pacific Theater was in large part due to the striking power of aircraft launch from aircraft carriers. In fact, at the height of the war, the U.S. Navy had upwards of 105 aircraft carriers of various types. But only two and a half decades earlier, the U.S. Navy was very much opposed to the idea of building aircraft carriers. In the summer of 1919, despite the fact the Navy had a growing and increasingly capable Air Force, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral William S. Benson, said, I cannot conceive of any use that the fleet will ever have for aircraft. The Navy doesn't need airplanes. Aviation is just a lot of noise. Benson had just disbanded the Navy Aviation Division and redistributed aviation activities. However, the CNO did so without informing his civilian bosses in the Secretary of the Navy's office. And when the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was asked during congressional testimony whether the rumor that the Navy Aviation Division had been disbanded was true, Roosevelt emphatically said no. But not long after that hearing, Roosevelt was forced to correct the record when a U.S. Army Brigadier General named Billy Mitchell slipped members of the committee a copy of C.N.O. Benson's directive. So who was this Billy Mitchell and why did an Army officer care about the Navy's attitude towards airplanes? Mitchell, the son of a United States senator, dropped out of college in Washington, D.C. to join the Army as a private during the Spanish-American War. In less than two years, and largely because of his father's influence, he earned a commission and got orders to the Signal Corps. After seeing Orville Wright's flight demo for U.S. Army officials in 1908, Mitchell started taking private flight lessons at the Curtis Flying School in Newport News, Virginia, because at 33, he was too old and as a captain was too senior in rank to qualify for Army flight school as rudimentary as it was at the time. He remained in the Signal Corps. But being in the Signal Corps didn't keep him from incubating the belief that air power would change the face of modern warfare. And that belief, combined with his don't-wait-for-permission drive, made him a significant influence on the Army's early development of air power. In fact, even though he was the youngest member of the General Staff at the time, he was selected as the temporary head of the aviation section of the Signal Corps after his boss was relieved for dereliction of duty. Shortly after that, Mitchell was made the first Army's chief of the air service and promoted to major. When the United States declared war on Germany in April of 1917, Mitchell went to France to study the airplanes and air war strategies of the French and British. He started flying with French pilots and was the first American over German lines. During several of those flights, his tactical acumen and attention to detail provided Allied ground forces with important reconnaissance information. Within weeks, and without really checking with his own chain of command, he was leveraging his private flying experience and piloting French and British airplanes by himself. He never looked back, and neither did anyone around him, apparently. His type A personality, tireless enthusiasm, and willingness to risk suited his role as a combat pilot flying the SPAD in the observation and bomber roles. He quickly developed a reputation with the chain of command above him as both a loose cannon who was willing to disobey orders he didn't agree with and a daring and talented warrior they wanted to lead forces in the skies over hostile lands. Skies that had been more or less dominated by the Germans from 1914 through 1917. More often than not, when he deviated from what he was told, his course of action resulted in mission success, so in time his commanders let him come up with the plans. He was also mentored along the way by the best among the British and French pilots, including General Hugh Trenchard, commonly referred to as the father of the Royal Air Force. Mitchell was promoted to temporary lieutenant colonel and then temporary colonel five months after that, and given responsibility for developing how the U.S. Army would conduct air operations. Along with American aviation legends like ace Eddie Rickenbacker, who had his own unorthodox path to the cockpit, they helped turn the tide of the war. The highlight of Mitchell's time in combat was when he was tasked by the chief of the United States Army Air Service, Mason Patrick, to plan and lead the air campaign of the Battle of St. Mihiel, which was designed to stop the German Army's final attempt at an advance. Mitchell's plan involved 28 French British, and Italian squadrons that included 701 pursuit planes, 366 observation planes, and 414 bombers. The overall campaign was led by the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, General John J. Pershing, who was a believer in combined operations and pushing authority as far down the chain of command as possible, which allowed leaders like Mitchell in the air and Patton and MacArthur on the ground to be audacious while also forcing them to understand more than just their piece of the puzzle. And oh, by the way, also serving in General Pershing's force was a young artillery captain named Harry S. Truman. 
The St. Mihiel campaign took place in September of 1918 and was an unqualified success despite the fact it rained hard for the first five days of it, making the battlefield even more muddy than it already was. And that success was in no small part due to the air superiority afforded by the fighters and the well-coordinated close air support provided by the bombers. Air power's utility had been proven, or so Billy Mitchell assumed. For his efforts, Mitchell was promoted to temporary brigadier general and given the title of Chief of Air Service and Chief Group of Armies. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the French Croix de Guerre. Mitchell returned to the United States after 18 months of war and was frustrated to discover that few shared his view that the U.S. Army should adopt the Royal Air Force model of making aviation its own branch of the military. Further, in the post-war reorganization, instead of getting a billet Mitchell believed was justly his to fill, General Pershing, now Deputy Chief of Staff, made his West Point classmate and commander of the Rainbow Division during the war, Major General Charles Menaher, the director of the Army's Air Service, despite the fact that Menaher was an artillery officer and not an aviator. Unlike Mitchell, Menaher shared Pershing's view that the Army's Air Branch should remain subordinate to the Infantry Branch. However, Brigadier General Mitchell wasn't one to let minor details like where he was in the chain of command stop him from attempting to advance the cause of military aviation. And as a national celebrity of sorts, Mitchell knew how to use the press to get his opinions in front of the right members of Congress and the public at large. He was also willing to go around his boss in the process, and Major General Menaher wasn't a strong enough leader to order him to cease and desist. Mitchell's first target was his own service, and among his more cutting quotes was one picked up by several major newspapers where he said, the general staff knows as much about the air as a hog does about skating. But he reserved his strongest criticisms for the U.S. Navy. As CNO Benson's quote indicates, with very few exceptions, the Navy's leaders didn't consider aviation by itself as a viable warfighting capability. Battleships were their focus, and Congress had just approved the building of 10 more of the new Arizona class to support the Navy's doctrinal mission of being the nation's first line of defense by stopping threats at sea. The U.S. Army's responsibility for defense of the homeland started at the shoreline. Mitchell challenged that paradigm in a statement to the New York Herald in late 1919 that it read, The Air Service should be organized not only of equal, but of greater importance than the naval organization. The air will prevail over the water in a very short space of time. During subsequent congressional testimony, he told lawmakers that battleships should be equipped with catapults to launch Army airplanes. And if the Navy wasn't willing to do that, they should build the Army aircraft carriers and extend their responsibility for homeland defense beyond the coastline. He made that statement knowing that the Navy had just canceled plans to build their first aircraft carrier and redirected the funds to the battleship fleet. Mitchell ended the testimony by telling Congress that U.S. Army bombers could sink any current or future battleship, and he suggested a demonstration to prove his point. What Mitchell didn't know is the Navy had already done one, and it didn't go well for the battleship Mafia. The USS Indiana, a decommissioned battleship, sunk after repeated bomb hits from Navy and Marine Corps aircraft. The Navy swore all the participants to secrecy, but word leaked out anyway. First, the New York Tribune published a series of photos showing massive bomb damage to the Indiana as a result of the tests. Congress demanded to know more, and Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels put out a Director of Naval Gunnery's report that concluded the entire experiment pointed to the improbability of a modern battleship being either destroyed or completely put out of action by aerial bombs. Lawmakers no sooner accepted that conclusion when other sources revealed that the bombs used in the U.S. Navy's test to sink the battleship hadn't been live but were filled with sand. Billy Mitchell immediately short-circuited the Navy's attempt to explain away this latest and somewhat embarrassing revelation by telling the House Appropriations Committee, we can either destroy or sink any ship in existence today. All we want to do is to have you gentlemen watch us attack a battleship. Give us the warship to attack and come watch it. SecNav Daniels retorted, I would be glad to stand bareheaded on the deck or at the wheel of any battleship while Mitchell tried to take a crack at me from the air. If he ever tries to aim bombs on the decks of naval vessels, he will be blown to atoms long before he gets close enough to drop salt on the tail of the Navy. The game was on. Only the outcome of this game could well determine the budget priorities and the warfighting focus of the Army and the Navy for the next 20 years or so. Congress gave the lead for this test to the Navy, specifically Captain Alfred Johnson, the commander of the air wings of the Atlantic Fleet, who was also not a pilot. And of course, Johnson quickly established some ground rules that favored the battleship's survival. One, the ship had to be in deep water, 100 fathoms or more, to prevent the concussion from bouncing off the bottom and breaking the keel from below. That requirement meant the target ship would be at least 50 miles east of the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. Two, the bombers were not allowed to use torpedoes, only bombs. Three, 
Army aircraft were only allowed two direct hits total, and inspectors would go aboard to survey the damage after each hit. Mitchell saw from the start that the Navy was limiting his lethality and also trying to run his airplanes out of gas by having the target well out to sea and stopping the test for inspection after each hit. And in spite of the constraints put on him by the rules of the test, he designed his side of it to accomplish his interpretation of the mission. The biggest bomb at the time was a 1,000-pounder, not enough to sink a battleship with two hits, so Mitchell had the chief of the Army's Aircraft Armament Division create a special 2,000-pounder for the test. Doubling the weight meant there were only two bombers available to carry out the test, Hanley Page 0-400s and the brand-new twin-engine Martin MB-2 biplane. Mitchell handpicked the best aerial marksmen from among the aviators assigned to his first provisional air brigade at Langley Field in Hampton, Virginia. He told them that because of the two direct hits rule, they were to aim for near misses that would blow holes in the hole from the side without counting as a direct hit. Mitchell wasn't going to be flying in a bomber for the test, but he would be overhead as an observer in his personal de Havilland DH-4B that he nicknamed Osprey. After some inconclusive preliminary tests, the grand event was set for July 20th and 21st, 1921. The target was the big daddy of them all, Ostfriesland, the captured German Navy battleship that had taken 18 hits from the Royal Navy at the Battle of Jutland, struck a mine on the way home, and was ready again for action two months later. Ostfriesland had multiple hulls for protection against mines and torpedoes. The ship was divided into separate watertight compartments, so it could not be sunk by any single hull. It was as close to unsinkable as any warship had ever been. On July 20th, the USS Henderson, a transport ship, put to sea out of Norfolk with 300 VIP observers on board, including the new Army Chief of Staff, General Pershing, who still felt that air power was only valuable insofar as it supported the infantry, the Secretaries of War and the Navy, 18 members of Congress, 50 reporters, and a variety of admirals and generals. Mitchell was overhead in Osprey. Much to Mitchell's displeasure, Test Director Johnson's plan gave the Navy and Marine Corps airplanes the first go at Ostfriesland, doing little or no damage during their hour and 17 minutes of dropping 600-pounders. As the U.S. Army's Martins and Hanley Pages arrived, Johnson, who was stationed on the deck of Henderson, told them to enter a holding pattern while the inspectors took a look aboard the target ship following the first wave of attacks. What turned out to be an hour-long delay in combination with the extended transit from Langley Field gave Mitchell's men only one run each on the battleship. At the end of day one, Ostfriedsland was still very much afloat. The Navy reps on Henderson smiled and patted each other on the back. The Secretary of the Navy was quoted by the Washington Post as saying that he wasn't surprised and that it was a thousand to one shot that the ship would not be sunk by the bombing. Back in the ready room at Langley, Mitchell circled up with his pilots and debriefed what had happened. They all agreed the game was rigged, and Mitchell told them to be ready for last-minute changes to the plan once airborne, in the event it became evident they weren't going to get a fair chance to prove what their bombers could do. The second and final day was divided into two events, with the first launch in the morning and the second one at noon. The first event was a flight of Martins, and during their first passes, one of them scored a direct hit. The explosion looked very dramatic from the Henderson. Captain Johnson immediately stopped the test, saying he needed to send his inspectors aboard, and he also said the quiet part out loud, exclaiming, By Jove, we're not going to sink this ship! The subsequent delay caused by the inspectors going aboard Ostfriedland sent the Army airplanes back to base still carrying nine bombs. Worse, before the second group of airplanes launched for the final event, Captain Johnson sent a message telling them that they could only carry three bombs total among all the airplanes, even though they planned to use six Martins and two Hanley Pages, each armed with a 2,000-pounder. Mitchell was furious, and he sent word back to the Henderson that he was launching with his full complement of bombers armed as originally planned, and they would roll in on the target, quote, until we have secured the two direct hits the Army Air Service is authorized to make, end quote. Captain Johnson didn't reply. The first bomb fell at 12.18, a near miss is directed, and as Mitchell looked down from Osprey, he was elated to see the battleship rise nearly 10 feet out of the water. By the time the sixth one hit in a similar fashion at 12.31, the Ostfriesland was done for. At 12.40, the legendary battleship rolled and sank, and as it did, one of the Hanley pages dropped one last bomb at the spot as a final salute. Back on dry land, the Navy immediately attempted to counter the widespread press coverage by saying that the Ostfriesland only sunk because Mitchell had broken the rules. Mitchell publicly shot back that he only did what was necessary to make the test fair and that he was sure that Captain Johnson had orders from the CNO himself not to let the Army sink the battleship. 
The Joint Army and Navy Board report on the bombing test was made public three weeks later, and it stated, The battleship is still the backbone of the fleet and the bulwark of the nation's sea defense, and will so remain so long as the safe navigation of the sea for purposes of trade or transportation is vital to success in war. The airplane, like the submarine, destroyer, and mine, has added to the dangers to which battleships are exposed, but has not made the battleship obsolete. The report was signed by one guy and one guy only, General John J. Pershing, certainly as a show of support for the Navy's priorities as well as his own. But much to the ire of the senior-most levels of both the Army and the Navy in light of their own budgetary priorities, Mitchell won in the court of public opinion, and his influence among average Americans extended beyond what he'd enjoy coming out of the war. He fueled that fire by leaking part of his own post-test report, which the Army had suppressed, to the New York Times. The report read in part that, quote, had the Army Air Service been permitted to attack as it desired, none of the sea craft attacked would have lasted 10 minutes in a serviceable condition, end quote. Mitchell's boss, Major General Menaher, had finally had enough of his insubordination, and he told General Pershing either Mitchell went or he would. Pershing, in turn, took the issue to the Secretary of the Army, John Weeks, and Weeks, being the good political appointee he was, and understanding the importance of public opinion, decided he didn't want his legacy to be the guy who fired Billy Mitchell and that Menaher needed to retire. But General Pershing wasn't about to let Brigadier General Mitchell continue with his crusade unchecked, so he gave Menaher's former position to Mason Patrick, who'd been Mitchell's boss during the war, and, in theory, knew how to keep him in line. Unlike Menaher, Patrick was actually an Army pilot, having bent the rules in his own way to put himself through flight school at the ripe old age of 60. At the same time, Mitchell's focus on his crusade, as well as his tendency to drink too much, which led to erratic behavior at home, was taking a toll on his personal life. In 1922, his wife Caroline filed for divorce, scandalous at that time, and although accusations were thrown back and forth in court, she won custody of their three children and alimony of $400 a month. Mitchell remarried in 1923 and ultimately had two more kids with his second wife, Elizabeth. Major General Patrick sent Mitchell to Europe on an inspection tour as a way to keep him out of the headlines, but that strategy only gave Mitchell more ideas for how to bring air power into greater prominence. During his time on the road, he wrote a 324-page report that was made into a book titled Wing Defense, published in 1925, that predicted that air power would be a dominating factor in the world's development. The book also predicted that the next war would be against Japan, and that they would start it by attacking Pearl Harbor, not from aircraft carriers, which he viewed as lacking enough striking power for such an attack, but from islands in the Pacific close enough to Hawaii for future long-range bombers to reach. That prediction got the attention of none other than President Calvin Coolidge, who wasn't happy that he had to do damage control with the Japanese ambassador. Coolidge raised hell with Secretary Weeks, who in turn raised hell with General Pershing, who in turn ordered Major General Patrick to take care of the Mitchell problem once and for all. Mitchell was demoted to colonel and sent to the desolate 8th Corps area in San Antonio, Texas. Meanwhile, in the years since the battleship tests, the U.S. Navy was forced to take small and somewhat reluctant steps towards Billy Mitchell's vision of air power. They created the Bureau of Aeronautics, which was actually the first new bureau in the Navy since the Civil War. Then the Washington Treaty for the Limitation of Naval Armaments, in which the United States and other nations agreed to ceilings on capital ships, curtailed the construction of battleships, and the Navy began its transition from battleships to carriers, starting by converting the USS Jupiter to the USS Langley in 1922. But doctrinally, even as they embraced the notion that airplanes might actually have some utility in future conflicts, the Navy still considered the carrier only useful insofar as it could protect the battleship, and not a means of power projection by itself. But Mitchell's exile to the wilds of central Texas didn't prevent access to the newspapers, and in the wake of a series of crashes in the late summer of 1925 involving the Navy's rigid airship Shenandoah that killed all 14 aboard and three seaplanes transiting from the west coast to Hawaii that killed a dozen more, reporters asked him for his opinion. His answer included the statement that the mishaps were a direct result of both the Army and Navy's incompetence on matters pertaining to military aviation, and that the services were guilty of, quote, almost treasonable administration of the national defense, end quote. This time, Army-wise, Mitchell overplayed his hand. And on the direct order of President Coolidge, a few weeks after the quote came out, a court-martial containing eight counts of insubordination was convened against him. Mitchell's status as a military aviation icon made the seven-week trial in Washington, D.C. a high-profile affair. Among the 13 judges, none of them aviators, was Major General Douglas MacArthur, who wasn't happy about being involved and heard to say that, quote, a senior officer shouldn't be silenced for being at variance with his superiors in rank over accepted doctrine, end quote. Of course, years later, MacArthur's variance over accepted doctrine during the Korean War got him fired by President Truman. 
During the proceedings, Mitchell was unrepentant, and his defiance was on full display, including the unauthorized uniform he wore, which is one he designed for aviators that featured a tie instead of the high collar of the official uniform. Among those testifying on Mitchell's behalf were aviation legends like Eddie Rickenbacker, Hap Arnold, Carl Spatz, New York airport namesake Fiorello LaGuardia, and Robert Oltz, father of future double ace Robin Oltz. In spite of their testimony, Douglas MacArthur's sympathy, and overwhelming public sentiment in favor of Mitchell, he was found guilty on all counts and suspended from active duty for five years without pay. Mitchell resigned his commission rather than allowing himself to be subject to the court's ruling. Mitchell settled with Elizabeth in the peaceful horse country of Middleburg, Virginia, but never stopped advocating for military air power. He died of heart disease in a New York City hospital on February 19, 1936. He was only 56 years old. Mitchell's prediction in 1925 about Japan's aggression haunted the U.S. Navy in the years immediately following his death as the Japanese Empire invaded countries across the Far East and projected its power using airplanes launched from a growing fleet of aircraft carriers. But the American admirals steadfastly stuck with their priority, the battleship, as documented in the program for the 1941 Army-Navy game held in Philadelphia on November 29th. On page 180 of the program, there was a bow-on picture of the USS Arizona with the caption, Despite the claims of air enthusiasts, no battleship has yet been sunk by bombs. Eight days later, the USS Arizona was sunk by bombs dropped by over 400 Japanese bombers launched from six Imperial Navy aircraft carriers. At that point, the U.S. Navy's priority shifted to carrier power, and that hasn't changed since. Mitchell was honored with the name of the Army Air Force's B-25 bomber, most famously used by Jimmy Doolittle's Raiders in their raid on Tokyo, somewhat ironically launched from the aircraft carrier Hornet. And in 1946, he was posthumously awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for, quote, his outstanding pioneer service and foresight in the field of American military aviation, end quote. But attempts to have him posthumously promoted to Brigadier General met with resistance. In fact, no fewer than five bills were introduced to Congress between 1940 and 1947, but none of them passed because, as one historian put it, his true legacy was complicated by the fact that in real life, he was, quote, vain, petulant, overbearing, and egotistical, end quote. Another wrote that, quote, promoting him in death would not erase the questionable actions that proceeded from his passionate advocacy of air power's independence, end quote. Mitchell was finally promoted as part of the fiscal year 2005 National Defense Authorization Act, and although the Pentagon and White House never acted on the promotion in any official way, since that time he has generally been referred to as a Brigadier General. A major motion picture called The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell was released in 1955, starring the legendary actor Gary Cooper as Mitchell. While the film takes some Hollywood-type liberties with the sequence of events around the battleship tests, much of the dialogue used in trial scenes is taken directly from the court transcript, including this one. You say here that in future wars, soldiers will invade peaceful lands by leaping in parachutes from airplanes in the sky. Would you care to reveal who gave you this startling information? Nobody gave it to me. It's quite obvious to anyone with the slightest foresight. Now, in this letter, you recommend that the armed forces be separated into three branches, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force. Is that your opinion? It is. Why did you seek to divide the fighting forces of this country? I didn't mean to divide them. I recommended that they all be combined under a single Department of National Defense with specialists in command of each branch. You state here that the Army should investigate methods of protection against air raids, including alarm signals and bomb shelters. Bomb shelters. Is it your actual belief that this country is vulnerable to attack from the air? It is my belief, if not now, at least within the foreseeable future. Colonel Mitchell, do you have any idea of the width of the Atlantic Ocean? Approximately 3,000 miles. And the Pacific Ocean? I know what you're getting at. And I tell you, it won't be long before an airplane will fly nonstop across both oceans. Carrying bombs. Carrying bombs. Colonel Mitchell, do you realize that your declarations, if taken seriously, could result in creating panic among the people of our country? I'd rather have the people scared than dead. Now, in this one, you make the statement that, quote, airships traveling a thousand miles an hour will fight each other in the stratosphere. Unquote. Colonel Mitchell, do you have any comprehension how fast a thousand miles an hour is? Of course I do. Do you know that it's faster than the speed of sound? It's approximately 250 miles faster than the speed of sound. Are there any airplanes today that can go 250 miles an hour? We don't have any, I can tell you that. 
But you said, sir, that they wouldn't only go 250 miles an hour, but they would go 250 miles faster than the speed of sound. That's correct. Anyone with any knowledge of the air knows that the ultimate speed of aircraft is almost unlimited. It depends only on technical development. That exchange frames Mitchell as a visionary vindicated by how military aviation unfolded throughout the 20th century. He was right on paratroopers, transoceanic and supersonic flight, and a single department of defense over the branches of the military instead of a war department for the army and a navy department for the navy. The department of defense was created in 1947, 11 years after Mitchell died. Mitchell was an innovator, and innovators are always complicated and controversial figures, and their genius can be blurred by their faults. But too often, history shows that organizations like the U.S. military resist the change these innovators advocate until it is thrust upon them by external forces. And in the case of a military, that external force is usually the enemy. That'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything, including our news coverage going forward. And if you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.